Today, I'm going to talk to you about images. We're going to talk about pictures and video and media. We are bombarded with images, constant stream of visual information. But what happens when that stream turns into a flood? Children today are being called Generation M. The M stands for media. These children, um, new research has shown that a child or a young person today on average accesses an individual interaction with their mobile device around two and a half thousand times. Some heavier users are up in the five and six thousand. Many, many young people consume over eight hours of media a day. These young people will see more images than anyone in the history of the world has ever seen before. I love watching movies, so I was recently talking to a student about movies, and he told me he didn't like watching movies with subtitles. When I asked him why he didn't like them, he said, because I have to pay attention. <laughs> but this is not, you're laughing as if this is something unusual. It's not. This is the norm now. We all live in this world where we constantly multitask. Many of you driving here will have been looking through your windscreens while having a GPS, a digital stream of information combining with the real world visual stream that you simultaneously process. So to talk about images, we need to know why they are important. And images are important because they have power. Images convey meaning. They help us to understand the world. Images convey emotion. The moving pictures we watch, the movies, the paintings we look at. Images also help our memory. You've all heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. But images can do way more than that. Images have the power to change our memories. Human memories are not set in stone. Memories are fluid. Images have the power to affect our decision-making and the choices we make. So if these images are changing our emotions, our memories, our behaviors, they're changing us. So I want to take you back to the 1970s and the work of a great researcher called Elizabeth Loftus. And in the 1970s, she, she showed a lot of groups of people the same video of a motor vehicle accident. And she asked one group, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? And that group said that the average speed among that group was about 30 miles an hour. She asked another group, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? And that group said 40 miles an hour. They had only watched that video minutes before. And already, by changing one word in a sentence, she could change their memories enough to cause a difference of 10 miles an hour. And this work's been repeated over and over again and proved in many different experiments. It's often called the misinformation effect or suggestive evidence. And it's an example of a cognitive bias. We have many cognitive biases in our lives. These affect us hundreds of times every day. One example is a serial positioning effect. We remember the things we see first, the th things we see last, and forget about the things in the middle. When you're browsing through those movies on Netflix or Amazon Prime, you are way more likely to choose the ones at the start of the queue and the end of the queue. Netflix knows this, and it puts movies there it wants you to watch. Anchoring. The best example is retail. If I'm trying to sell shoes for $100 and no one's buying them, the best thing I can do is put the price up to $500.
wait until enough people have seen that $500 price, then cut it down to $200. What we've done is we've anchored on that 500 figure and every subsequent decision is made based on a number relative to that 500. We all think we're getting a bargain. Framing. We like to win more than we like to lose. So how I present a question to you will affect how you make your choice. If there are 400 people and I tell you if you make this choice you will save 200 of them, you might make that choice. If I tell you there are 400 people and if you make this choice you're going to kill 200 of them, you probably won't make that choice. We prefer the glass half full more than half empty. So there's all these cognitive biases, hundreds of them, and they affect us in small ways hundreds of times a day in every decision we make. And why is this important? Well, this is the key message I'm trying to get across to you in this presentation. If the research has shown that I can seriously affect every decision you make by changing one word, showing you one number, moving something in a list, Imagine what I can do when I start showing you images. So for the past, well, over 20 years, I've worked on creating graphical reconstructions for courtrooms, reconstructions of forensic evidence. And these are used in courtrooms all over the world. We make them using the same technology the film and computer games industry use. And they're used to help people understand a chronology of events, whether it's in a crime scene, a murder trial, a terrorist trial, a plane uh, disaster, or a road traffic accident. But more importantly than just creating these things, as an academic, as a professor, I've spent over 20 years researching what happens when we use these things in a courtroom. If I start showing you these images, Am I going to change your memory of an incident or your decision-making ability? So, and this is really, nowhere is this more important than in a courtroom. In a courtroom, a person or a company can win or lose millions of dollars. Reputations can be gained and lost. People can lose their liberty through incarceration, jail. And in extreme cases, someone could lose their life with a death sentence. So it's vital that we can provide objective and unbiased information. But we know images have the potential to have all this bias. But images have something else. They're interesting and engaging. You've probably all seen this famous statistic that a goldfish um, only has an attention span or a memory of around nine seconds. There's been a lot of research on human attention span. Uh, a lot of work in Canada with very large sets of participants and research all over the world has shown that over the last 20 years, human attention span has gone down from 12 seconds to 8 seconds. So congratulations, you have an attention span less than that of a goldfish. <laughs> we, and this becomes, again, very crucial because we pay attention to different things. Humans pay more attention to things that move. We pay then attention to 3D objects, then to 2D pictures, 2D diagrams, and less attention to the written word and the spoken word. So, did you all see what happened there? Many of you in this room stopped listening to me because something interesting was happening on the screen. And that's what happens. Our attention is drawn away to these moving images. They are very effective. And it seems strange that here I am, standing on a TED stage, talking to you, giving an oral presentation, hoping I can keep you all engaged. I'm a professor. And as professors, we often stand in front of classrooms, talking to students, trying to keep them awake. Someone defined to me that the definition of a university professor is someone who talks in other people's sleep. <laughs> so, in a courtroom, 
We need to keep the jury, the judge, the triers of fact, whoever's involved, interested and engaged. If they're interested and engaged, they will remember more, which will hopefully lead to better decision making in the courtroom where decision making is crucial. And what we find is, yes, people are, they are engaged by these moving pictures. And they do, their memory increases significantly and they do make better decisions. And often that outweighs all these cognitive biases that may be inherent in the images we're showing. So I want to talk about one specific example of reconstruction and another danger point of these images. So there's a lot of work at the moment in virtual archaeology, reconstructing ancient civilizations. I, working with colleagues, have built some of these. We've reconstructed ancient cities, ancient temples, ancient artifacts, mainly for mu museum exhibits. But there's an inherent problem when you do this kind of work. And an article in the Journal of Cultural Heritage stated this really clearly. And the problem is these 3D representations present a facade of truth. They present an object reality, um, an objective reality, when in fact they're very sub subjective. Humans have a natural capacity to believe something when they see it. And that's a problem with these kind of images in those kinds of situations, in the courtroom situation. I also do a lot of work on forensic facial reconstruction. Um, when skeletal remains are found, if you watch TV dramas, you'll have seen this many times. We can build a face on a skull, either using physical modeling techniques with clay or with computer-generated techniques. And hopefully that will lead to uh, a victim identification. And I want to talk about one example of this I worked on. So, um, because I do that sort of work, I get asked to do this for television uh, programs. And one I did quite a few years now was um, the case of Nefert Queen Nefertiti. This was for a Discovery Channel documentary. They wanted us to reconstruct the face of an Egyptian mummy who some archaeologists believe was Queen Nefertiti. I worked on this with uh, Professor Martin Everson from the University of Northumbria in the UK. And one of my students did most of the modeling, a guy called Tim Gilbert, who now works for Rockstar Games and builds the models for Grand Theft Auto. So we worked on this, the documentary came out, and the face was seen in news media all over the world and on websites. And I got a phone call. And a lady said to me, your reconstruction of Queen Nefertiti is wrong. And it took me aback a little bit. And I said, well, what do you mean wrong? She said, it looks nothing like Queen Nefertiti. So the obvious question was, well, how do you know it doesn't look like Queen Nefertiti? And she said in a very authoritative voice, because I am Queen Nefertiti. So sure, funny story, but she had a point. And it's something I've started to think about a lot more over the years I've done this work. The, the way the media and the news organi organizations present this information is often, this is the face of Queen Nefertiti. This is a face we haven't seen for 3,000 years. It's not. I can guarantee she looks something like that. We have scientific techniques for doing this, but it won't be exact. Forensic facial animation uh, uh, reconstruction is not an exact science. Virtual archaeology, archaeology is far from an exact science. Yet we say this is how Rome would have looked in our documentaries. It's not. It's one version. So we've got to be careful how we present this information, how we frame it, and how we show these images to people when we're using them. So to finish with, I'd like to talk about one final case or one final project I worked on. For a number of years, I lived in Australia. And when I was in Australia, I worked on a very large multi-million dollar project called Jive. 
And the Jive project stood for juries and interactive virtual evidence. And we worked with uh, a group team of academics left by, led by David Tate at Western Sydney University. And um, we worked with the Australian Federal Police, the equivalent of the FBI in Australia, and the Institute of Judicial Administration. And in the Supreme Court in Sydney, we ran a series of trials. We ran terrorism trials. And we had real judges, real lawyers, real forensic experts, and multiple juries in every trial so that we could collect more data from juries. Now, in these trials, after we had run them, each trial had different evidence, different visual evidence. We wanted to see if we could change the decisions people made in the courtroom using this visual evidence. And the good news is, we didn't. People actually make good decisions in those situations. Humans have the capacity for good decision making. When we know something's important, we talk about it. We think about it. We weigh the evidence. And that's what people did, which far outweighed any cognitive bias we could put in through these images. The bad news, though, is even though we can get past these cognitive biases, we don't. Hundreds and hundreds of times every day, your choices are being affected by these biases. So my takeaway message really is that media producers, the people who make the websites you visit, all of them know about this. When you're scrolling down a website, you think you don't look at adverts. Of course you do. It's the one thing that moves on the page. You've looked at it, even subconsciously, and then back to the text. They know how to make you look. So next time you're on a website and you're going to make a decision about what movie to watch or uh, perhaps what to buy or where to go to eat, just have a look at how the information has been presented to you. And just perhaps, sometimes, you'll make a better choice. Thank you.